Hello and welcome to another session of Introductory Statistics. In this session, we will be jumping into confidence intervals. And confidence intervals happen to be one of uh, the most crucial part of statistics. Both confidence intervals and hypothesis testing are kind of the hardest part of this course. Um, certainly the the parts that are struggled with the most on the final exam, uh, but they're also the heart and the soul of what it means to be statistics. So uh, as we talked about way back in chapter one, we said that uh, inferential statistics was taking the sample and the data and the measurements of the sample and using that to estimate what's happening in the overall larger population. And this is the chapter where we start doing that, uh, where we put together all that we've learned so far in uh, chapters really one through seven, um, but particularly chapters six and seven. Uh, we'll build on those to create our confidence intervals. And last chapter in chapter seven, we talked about the sampling distribution of sample means. Now, um, Newton, we could have, and I may, um, at some point go back and do this, we could have talked about the sampling distribution of sample proportions too in that chapter, but I decided for now um, not to include this section, but we will talk about them here in chapter 8, and so of course I'm going to talk about them now. We want to talk about uh, what a sample proportion is, of course. So the sample proportion is this P prime sample proportion um, and the population proportion is just P. So the apostrophe, most mathematicians read that as the word prime, like Amazon prime. So P prime uh, is what we call the sample proportion. So we're using um, the sample, we'll take a sample proportion and we'll get P prime. Uh, and P prime is a proportion, and remember all proportions are just fractions. Proportion really is a fancy way of saying fraction. Uh, and proportion formula is X, where we call X the number of successes. Um, and successes here is um, not what we would typically think of as a success. So a success could be uh, just any whatever category that we're concerned about in the problem. So it could be something bad like being diagnosed with cancer could be considered a success. So it's not using the traditional definition of success. And then anything that's not, a, um, not in our category of interest would be considered a failure even though it might be a good thing like not having cancer. So um, the the X always represents our number of successes, and the N always represents our sample size, as it has before. Uh, and so this P prime is going to be our sample proportion, uh, and then uh, this is the distribution of all the sample proportions. So let's say that we had the entire um, population of Austin P as our population and uh, we took a sample of size 30 and saw how many females. Female would be definition of success here because we're looking at the proportion of females. Uh, and so the proportion of females in a sample of size 30 might be something right here um, that is, um, we'll say, uh, 0.35 maybe, or it could be something right here like 0.95. Um, and it turns out that the sampling distribution of sample proportions is going to be this nice normal bell-shaped curve most of the time. Remember, for sample means, we knew it was going to be a normal distribution if we had a sample size of at least 30 or more. That's what we said back in the previous chapter with the simple central limit theorem. If we had at least 30 or more as our sample size, then we would be guaranteed to have this nice normal bell-shaped curve. Here, it's actually, we need at least five successes. Our X needs to be at least five, um, and we need at least five failures, which means um, that N minus X, N minus X is the sample size minus the number of successes, that'll be our number of failures. So N minus X also needs to be at least five. So if we have at least five failures and at least five successes, then it turns out that this sampling distribution of sample proportions is going to be a nice normal bell-shaped curve. Um, that is going to be centered at P. Remember last time we talked about the X bars being centered at mu. Here, 
the P primes will be centered at P, um, and they, they will have a standard deviation of this stuff. Um, so when we're talking about uh, the proportions normally, uh, the distribution of proportions they won't really have. We don't talk about proportions having a standard deviation. But the sampling distribution of sample proportions does have a standard deviation, um, and it's the standard error for the sampling distribution. That's what we always call the standard deviation, is standard error. Um, and the standard error um, is this, uh, square root of p prime times 1 minus p prime over n. And all of that is under the square root, um, p prime, 1 minus p prime, divided by n. Um, all of that is under the square root. Now, 95% uh, of the time, we're going to have p primes that will fall in this light blue area that will be within roughly two standard deviations of our mean of the actual p for the whole population. Uh, but 5% of the time, we're going to have like the, this P prime 1 here um, that represents uh, the stuff in the darker blue tail areas. So 2.5% here and 2.5% here for a total of 5% of the time, we're going to have stuff outside in those tail areas. And really what this is telling us is that 95% uh, of the time, if we go out two standard deviations or approximately two standard deviations, 95% of the time we will capture um, in our confidence interval, because these lines, when we go out two standard deviations, represent the confidence interval, they will capture the thing that we're trying to estimate. We'll break that down for you in just a little bit. Um, so the, what I've been talking about here is a point estimate. A point estimate is a single number, a single value, um, and P prime is a really good point estimate. So P prime estimates P. Um, so we use P prime, which is for our sample, remember. Um, so this is all for the sample, um, and this is all for the population. Um, so we use our sample to estimate our population, and in the same way, in the last chapter, and in the, this chapter as well, and then in the next chapter as well, we'll be using X bar to estimate the population mean mu. Um, and we could also say that we use the sample standard deviation to estimate the population standard deviation. So all of these things in our sample are considered point estimates because they are single numbers that represent our best guess for the parameter. And so um, here is a single point estimate and here is an interval estimate. And that's kind of the reason why we want to define what a point estimate is to contrast it with what an interval estimate is. So an interval is a range of numbers, not just a single number. So every there are actually infinitely many numbers that are here between 0.71 and 0.77. Uh, and so every number between 0.71 and 0.77 is part of our interval estimate. And so for a specific example, we're using coronavirus. Um, as you might have guessed from the viral symbol here, uh, as our example. So randomly, we're going to randomly test 821 U.S. adults to see if they have been inoculated with coronavirus. Um, and it turns out that 608 have, we are supposing for our example. So 821 um, and 608 have. And so what we would do here um, is we would uh, confirm that the 0.74 is in fact our P prime because P prime should be 608 over 821 because 608 is our number of successes here. So 608 divided by 821. Um, and yes, uh, so they only gave two significant digits, unfortunately, but if we round to two significant digits, we get 0.74. Uh, and so how likely is our population mean to be exactly 0.74? So we have, we have surveyed only 821 U.S. adults. How many U.S. adults are there? I'm not really sure, but there is an estimated 330 million U.S. Um, citizens. And so... Uh, there would be a lot of adults, um, maybe not 300 million, but uh, um, certainly close to 300 million U.S. adults, and that is a lot. 
more than 821. And even our 821, we see that it's not exactly 0.74. So how likely is our population mean to be exact? Not likely at all, like way, 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 way less than 1% chance. Um, but we have some tools that are available to us uh, that will tell us how we can be 95% likely to be in our interval. And let's talk about that. So on this slide, um, we will hearken back to the empirical rule back in Chapter 2 that we discussed where uh, in Chapter 2 we said 68% and 95%. And it turns out the book was really just giving us two significant digits there as well. If we were go to go to four significant digits, then it would be 68.26% and 95.44%. So 68.26%, that's pretty confident, but we definitely would like to be more confident. Uh, so we usually choose, 95% is actually what we usually choose. Um, but this isn't exactly 95%. We'll use it right now because we know that its z-score is 2 and negative 2. And so um, you probably already saw on my calculator that uh, I had uh, computed for 0.74. So remember 0.74 was our P prime. Uh, so here what we basically want to do is we want to start with our P prime and we want to add and subtract two standard deviations. Um, so we want to start with our, our center and add and subtract two standard deviations is what this is saying because we know that 95.44% will be within two standard deviations. So we start with our P prime of 0.74 and we subtract and we add um, two of our standard deviations. And our standard deviation formula is right here. So it's P prime, which is our 0 0.74, um, 1 minus P prime, 1 minus 0 0.74, and then divided by um, 821. All of that's under the square root and of course multiply by 2. And I've already done that here. And look, if I round, even though we shouldn't be using exactly 2, we should be using a number that's going to be slightly less than 2 um, because of course we want 95%, not 95.44%, but even even doing that, um, we still get the right answer for the 95th um, percent, 95 percent confidence interval, uh, and so 0.71 to 0.77 is what that's going to give us if we round to only the given two significant digits, like they have. Uh, and so, with that in mind, we can kind of start building our confidence intervals. So uh, the sampling distribution tells us that even though my, 0.77, uh, my 0.74 that I started with wasn't in exactly the center, once I add and subtract those two standard deviations, I'm going to have a 95% chance of capturing P because 95% of my P primes are going to be in the light blue area and only 5% of the time am I going to be wrong. Um, so 5% of the time, my P prime, the sample that I have randomly selected, will not actually be um, in the light blue area that captures 95% of it. So basically what this is saying is that confidence intervals are wrong 5% um, of the time if you've got a 95% confidence interval. Uh, so do not count on them being 100% correct. Statistics is almost never 100% correct. Um, and so uh, this is not 100%, but it's, it's pretty good. It's a pretty decent estimate if you kind of follow the rules. And I'll give you a little hint at the end as to something that might go wrong. And uh, the margin of error is how we build our confidence interval. So um, we start with a point estimate and we go a margin of error to the left and a margin of error to the right to build our whole confidence interval. Uh, and we've already hinted about how we can build the margin of error. That's our z-score, which we used 2 uh, previously, but we knew it had to be a little less than 2 because 2 is for 95.44%. Um, it turns out that it's 1.960, and I'll show you in just a second how we get that number. Um, and so we have the, the z-score times the uh, standard deviation for the sampling distribution, which we also call standard error. That's what this represents, standard error. Um, so the standard deviation for the sampling distribution of sample proportions. Uh, and once we multiply these two together, that's called our margin of error because we go a margin of error to the left and a margin of error to the right. And also because the margin of error 
is our room for error and using uh, P prime to estimate P. So we start with our P prime, we go a margin of error to the left and a margin of error to the right to build our confidence interval. And again, this is really the margin of error formula on your formula card for proportions. Uh, you will have a margin of error formula for means as well that will use means instead of proportions. Uh, so I mentioned the z-score on the previous slide was 1.960 for 95% confidence. Um, turns out we can use chapter 6 to find the z-scores. So uh, remember back in chapter 6 where we drew pictures, if we have 95% in the center, then that means we have 2.5% on this tail and 2.5% on this tail. Um, for a total of 5% for both tails. And so uh, the z-score we want is the z-score that's right here. And it has 2.5% to the right, but that means that it has 1 minus 2.5% to the left. Um, another way we could write this is a z with a subscript of 0 0.025. And I know that seems strange that we're doing area to the right as the subscript, um, but that tends to be the convention, even though inverse norm always takes an area to the left, um, when you use subscripts, um, and we'll use this a lot more in the very next section, the last half of this chapter, um, when we use subscripts, we do area to the right. Um, but we can find area to the left easily by subtracting area to the right from 1 because we know the area of the whole curve has to be 1. Uh, and then instead of the mean I can use 0 and instead of the standard deviation I can use 1 because that is the mean and the standard oops the mean and the standard deviation for um, the z-scores are always going to be 0 and 1. And when I put all of this in the calculator um, and let me actually do that let me put this um, in the calculator so second DISTR inverse norm and then again my area because I'm going to use area to the left is going to be 1 minus the 0.025 um, and it already has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1 as the default usually unless you've already used this cal calculator function for other stuff of course um, and the reason that is the default is because that's the mean and standard deviation for the z-scores which are often, so often used. And then if we round to four significant digits, we get 1.9 um, and then this 9 gets round up and this 9 rounds up the 5 to 6, so we get 1.960 if we do four significant digits. Uh, and hopefully that makes sense. And then, as you kind of saw a sneak peek of, uh, we can also talk about 99%. With 99%, um, of course, we're going to have 99% that are in the center here, and that leaves 1% for both of the tails, or half of a percent for each of the tail. Um, so we divide 1% by 2, we get half of a percent. And so we would do inverse norm of 1 minus that half of a percent, or 0 0.005. Uh, and then, of course, our mean and standard deviation are still going to be 0 and 1, and that will give us 2.576 as our z-score. And so we can get the z-scores that way if we want to. And uh, so remember that the margin of error builds the entire confidence interval. So any confidence interval can be said to be the point estimate plus or minus the margin of error because we start with our point estimate, um, and then we go a margin of error to the left and a margin of error to the right. And really, you may be given problems where you're um, only given the confidence interval itself and you're asked to find the margin of error. And here you can see, oh, two margins of error equals the width of the confidence interval. So I just need to subtract the upper minus the lower limit of the confidence interval to get my width of my confidence interval and divide that by two because I know the width of the interval equals two margins of error. Uh, and then we can build our confidence interval knowing that it's the point estimate plus or minus the margin of error because our point estimate for P is going to be P prime and our margin of error is always the um, Z or T score. Uh, we'll talk about T scores in association with the means. We, never, we always use Z with proportions. Um, so we'll talk more about T scores in the next video. 
Uh, and so here we have the z-score, the standard normal score, uh, times the standard error for proportions. And so the standard error for proportions specifically is all under the square root p prime times 1 minus p prime over n. And so that gets multiplied by our z-score. But there's an easier way than doing all of this, by the way, a much easier way, and that's called <laughs> stat test one prop z int. So you can use this great big huge formula um, where you would have to find the z-score um, and then you would have to stick in p prime and p prime and p prime and n and make sure you got all your parentheses and stuff right and you'd have to do it twice because you have to do it once for subtraction and once for addition or you could just use one prop z int and I'm about to show you how easy that will be. Um, here is the the same thing basically um p some textbooks use a hat um a little carrot triangle thing on top right here um that that symbol um instead of the the apostrophe prime symbol so p hat minus 1.96 because if you're doing for 95 percent your z score is going to be 1.96 um so minus 1.96 times the standard error um or plus 1.96 times the standard error uh, and that's how you you build the confidence interval or if you are smart and wanting to save a lot of time a lot of time on your homework you will use the one prompt z end uh, let's do an example and we'll we've kind of already done it by hand we use 2 instead of 1.96 actually I guess we could go back and just change that 2 to 1.96 let me do second enter a lot to get um, yeah okay and then I'll go ahead and do minus first and then 1 and then I'm gonna insert because I, I want to scoot the other stuff over um, I'll put the zero there too, and uh, then we'll change the minus to a plus. Here it didn't make a difference, probably because we only used two significant digits, and that's why I ask for three significant digits so that I can make sure that you're doing things uh, correctly. Um, but here we still get 0.71 and 0.77, um, whether we used uh, two or 1.960. Uh, but let's do this the faster way than, than all of this, because remember we had to find the z-score out for this too. Although most of the time you'll be doing 95%, so most of the time you will be using 1.960. Um, but the Newton will definitely ask you for other ones too. Um, so, uh, oh, we didn't write that on here. That would have been nice, helpful. Um, so the stat test one prop z, let me just copy that um, so that you'll have it in your lecture notes on here um, and put it some someplace a little more useful um, so uh, yeah that tells us to go to stat and then we want to scroll right to test by the way everything that we'll use in chapters eight and nine will be in this function area the test area um, technically what we're doing right now is not a test it's an interval um, but they put all of the intervals and in all of the tests and there are a whole bunch of types of tests and intervals that this short course does not get into if you were taking AP statistics you would get into more than half of them I would say um, but we do not get into very many of them at all unfortunately in this course um, if you take a second course in statistics uh, for whatever major you have then you will probably get to explore a good many of the rest of these tests um, and so know that they they are great resources for you uh, we want the one prop z test which we have to scroll down or you can scroll up actually either one it's about the same distance um, to a or we could have hit alpha a um, because we know that it's option a and our x again is our number of successes so that's 608 and then our n is 821 and our confidence level is 95 percent um, and see if i hadn't done all the explanation this would be you know boom 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 five seconds and you are finished with your confidence interval um, so this is a very fast process uh, you look at your formula card and it tells you to do stat test um, one prop z int. The longest part was finding the one prop z int, and then we were like, okay, number of successes, um, total number of our sample size, so number of successes x, total number of our sample size n, and then the percentage. Um, oh, one thing I didn't mention is that your C level you can do is 0.95 
or 95, either one, and it'll give you the same answer. I can change it right now, um, and you'll see it'll give you the same answer. So uh, it will give you the 0.71 that we have here and the 0.77 here. Of course, if we do three significant digits, it would be 0.711 and 0 0.771 because we would have to round up since each of the next digits is five or more. And so uh, that is pretty much confidence intervals for proportions. There are a couple of topics that we need to explore that are associated with confidence intervals. Um, and that's how uh, the first of the topics is how the confidence interval width changes depending on a couple of things. The first thing um, is that the confidence interval width changes depending on the confidence level that you set, of course. And so if we happen to want to be more confident, being more confident would be a good thing because you would be more certain that you were correct. Um, so if we happen to want to be more confident, like 99% confident, um, that would actually result in a wider interval. So back here, we were 95% sure that between 71% and 77% were inoculated. But let's suppose that our boss says, you know, 95% is not good enough. I want to be 99% certain. Well, you could do that, but you would have a wider interval um, of the percentage of the population. So it might be 65% to 83% or something like that. I'm just throwing some numbers out there. Um, but that wouldn't be as precise. It wouldn't tell you as precisely. Um, for example, without doing any numbers, without even knowing what the data is, I can say that I'm 100% confident that between 0 and 100% of the population is inoculated. But that doesn't tell me anything because proportions are always between 0 and 100%. So, um, the increasing the percentage of confidence is a good thing, but having a wider um, interval means that you're you're less precise. Actually, the this number is your accuracy, your percentage of accuracy. Um, this number is your precision. So uh, those of you familiar with target practice can know that uh, you can maybe have a target that's right here, and you can be hitting. Um, if your scope is off, for instance, you could be very precise and not very accurate, or you could be very accurate. Um, this might be a newbie. Um, this, this might be me shooting at the target, or or maybe even wider shooting at the target. Um, so you can be very accurate on average. So if you average these four little dots, um, then it would average to these, but they're way far. They're all way far away. Um, so on average, my accuracy is perfect, but my precision really sucks. Um, so when you have a wide confidence interval, your precision sucks, um, uh, but your accuracy might be great. So when you increase your accuracy, you're sacrificing your precision, is what I'm saying. And when you, um, de uh, when you improve your precision, um, which is decreasing the width of the confidence interval, um, then you are sacrificing your accuracy. So um, it's a little bit of a, you have to weigh you know, those two. Um, there is one way, though, that you can improve both. Uh, it costs moolah, though, some money. Um, so you're in increasing your sample size will improve your precision. Uh, so you see that we have the, the width narrowed, which is what we want, um, if we increase our sample size. And we can leave precision, we can leave the percentage of accuracy the same, um, the same level that we want, and improve through increasing our sample size. Um, so keep that in mind that as you uh, increase, as you increase your confidence interval, you're also increasing your margin of error, which is a bad thing. Um, as you increase your sample size, though, you're decreasing your margin of error, which is a good thing. And so in summary, we um, do have one topic after this, though. But in summary for computing the confidence intervals, this is the by far the very best way to compute it. It's easier. It'll compute the Z for you, so you don't have to find out what your Z-score is. You can just do one prop Z int. Um, you don't have to put all this complicated formula in there, um, which there's a whole bunch of room for mistakes when you use 
this formula, by the way, so you're much less likely to get the right answer than if you use the calculator function as well. So the calculator function, if you can use it, definitely do. Um, if you uh, want to understand the formula, what the calculator is doing, though, that's why we went through the formula and why the formula is on your formula card. Uh, one thing that we haven't talked about yet uh, is assumptions. Uh, that we will talk about them a lot more in the next chapter than we talk about them in this chapter, but remember that a simple random sample uh, for our population of all U.S. adults, we would have to uh, have a list of all U.S. adults, which would be almost 300 million names on our list, and then we would number that list from one to whatever, and we would use a random number generator to choose our 800 and whatever, 821 um, people who would be part of our simple random sample. And that way it takes the choice out of the equation, so it is truly random. Uh, and then, in addition to having to have that, which, by the way, most studies you read probably won't even have this. Um, so it's if they don't have this, then their results aren't guaranteed to be 95% accurate, like they're claiming that they are, by the way. Um, so this one, I would say that most studies don't need that. They, they really just don't. Um, and so whenever you read a study, that's the first thing I would look for. Did they actually do a simple random sample, or did they ask for volunteers, <laughs> which is definitely not a simple random sample. Um, and then the second thing that we should look for, and this one's easy, especially according to this book, it says that you just need five and five. Um, so at least five successes and at least five failures. You need to get a large enough sample so that at least five of the people who are responding are in the category you're asking questions about. In other words, having been inoculated for coronavirus, um, and at least five of them have not been. Uh, so you, we had way more than that. We had 600 and something who were um, out of 800 and something, so the were, those who weren't were about 200, um, somewhere around in there. Um, so we definitely met that with flying colors, but that is something that you should check every single time. Uh, and then, last but not least, we uh, would have the sample size formula for estimating proportions, and this really should have an arrow to round this up right here because we always round this number up. If it's already a whole number we don't round, but if it has like 0 .0004 or something, we would round it up to the next whole number, which is different from how we normally round. Normally we round down as much as we round up, um, but here if it's not a whole number we always round up. Uh, so in computing the sample size, this is something that as a statistician you would do before you went out and collected data. So this is really kind of related to chapter one stuff. The reason we didn't do this in chapter one is because we didn't know what margin of error was in chapter one. We didn't know really what a z-score was in chapter one. Um, we didn't uh, have a good understanding of proportions in chapter one. Uh, so uh, all of this stuff it comes from our knowledge in this chapter. And specifically, if you take the margin of error formula and you manipulate it to solve for the sample size, that's exactly where we get this formula from. So the margin of error formula is z times the square root of p times one, p prime times 1 minus p prime over n. Um, you have to square both sides to get n out from underneath the radical, and then you have to cross multiply and do a whole bunch of algebra, basically, and then get n by itself. Um, you divide by the margin of error squared. and but when you do all of that, you get exactly this formula. So that's one of the reasons that it's in Chapter 8 as well, in addition to not really knowing all of these terms and understanding them. Uh, but here, what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to say, as our statisticians, we're going to say what we want the margin of error to be, um, the maximum we want the margin of error to be. And then we're going to say what we want our confidence level to be, our percentage of confidence. And uh, Newton always has us use this worst-case scenario of one-half, for our guess for p prime. Um, so we haven't done the survey yet, so we don't know what p prime is when we are using this formula. Um, if we had a guess though, uh, so for my example, I'm going to say let's do uh, a survey for political purposes. You've got two political candidates who are running against each other in a local election. Um, we will say let's be 3% accurate. Um, so our margin of error we want to be at most 3%. We want a 95% confidence as well. Um, 
And uh, so let's try to do this. We'll use, we'll suppose, if we had a survey before this, a poll, before this, a political poll before this, and it gave us the proportion who are voting for our candidate, we put that in there, absolutely. Um, but uh, Newton always says to use the worst case scenario, so we will use the worst case scenario here. Uh, in real life, though, we would want to use a guess if we had it. If we don't have a guess, we can always use half. Um, oh, and I've already done it here, so we have 0.5, um, 1 minus 0.5, um, and then times, uh, we're using 95%, so our z-score is 1.960. Don't forget to square it. So the squared key, of course, is right here. And then we divide by our margin of error. I said 3%. We've got to change that to proportions, which are always between 0 and 1. And so dividing 3 by 100 was 0 0.03, so 0 0.03. Don't forget to square that, too. I would say most students, in getting this wrong um, and getting the sample size wrong, will forget to square. That's usually where it happens, or they'll forget to round up. So this 1067.11, remember we said we were always going to round up, so that becomes 1068. Uh, and so that is chapter 8. <laughs> well, that's really only half of chapter 8. That's the chapter 8 half for proportions. Uh, and so you may begin to understand why this is a challenging chapter, um, but hopefully it's a really rewarding chapter too. I'm always fascinated by being able to use a small sample to estimate the entire population. Uh, and as you go through and you work on discussions and homework and projects and quizzes that are related to this chapter, do not forget your formula card, especially the calculator column, because the calculator will save you time and improve your accuracy on your answers, so improve your quiz scores and your exam scores, um, as we found out. And saving time on this monster chapter would be a very good idea. Um, the lecture notes will hopefully help you as well as you take notes on top of these notes. Uh, the textbook and the Newton instruction should also provide you with great definitions uh, and some instructive videos uh, for Newton as well if you'd like to see from their perspective. Uh, I would say that Newton and the textbook examples usually first tell you the long way to do it um, instead of emphasizing the calculator a shorter way to do that. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. And then if you still have questions about anything, which you should in Chapter 8, um, then please, please message me and ask me a question. If you could send me a screenshot of the question you're working on, that would be helpful so that I can um, best help you by addressing the exact question that you have. And I wish you the very best of luck as you go through this chapter. Thank you.